Welcome, I'm Michelle Leifer. I am the director of the USAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. On behalf of my colleague, Kimberly Young, I would like to thank you all for joining us for our third book club event, um, which is a conversation with Susan Orlean about her wonderful book on animals. Susan Orlean has been a staff writer at the New Yorker since 1992. She is the New York Times best-selling author of seven books, including The Library Book, Rin Tin Tin, Saturday Night, and The Orchid Thief. She lives with her family in, and her animals in Los Angeles and can be reached at SusanOrlean.com and on Twitter at SusanOrlean. Um, welcome, Susan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm, I'm really delighted to be with you, and thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Um, OK, so let's, let's get to it. Um, First of all, this, this collection of articles was just wonderful. Um, I know it spans really 20 years um, of, you know, of your writing about animals. I know not, it's, I'm sure it's not all inclusive of them, um, but what was your, behind your decision to pull them together now? I think there were a couple of things going on um, and they were both somewhat COVID related. I think during this last couple of years, a lot of us have in one way or another been looking back in our lives and thinking about what we value, what we've done that we care about. It's just been a very reflective time. And for me, that was certainly one of the impulses was looking at my career and thinking, what have I done that I feel good about? What have I, what are the issues that have drawn me repeatedly? Then early on in COVID, I did a story about rabbit hemorrhagic disease, which um, is this horribly infectious disease that's spreading through the domestic rabbit population and, and now spilling over into the wild rabbit population. And of course, the parallels to COVID were actually uh, quite frightening, to be honest with you, but it was one of the reasons that I was interested in doing the story. When I was working on that piece, I thought, boy, I've written a about animals over and over. It's a subject that keeps drawing me back. And it seems like there's never any limit to how many fascinating stories about animals and in many ways, how often those stories are about people, even though they seem to be about animals or they are metaphorically meaningful on a human level. It just then seemed like a perfect moment to do this survey through my career of the stories that that I've written about animals that, and seeing how they each uh, sort of were enlarged by being together with the other stories. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you've been writing about animals, you know, we're talking about these 20 years, but um, really you've been writing about them much longer. Um, I, is it true that the, your first book, uh, writing at five or six, was about animals? Um, it was. About that. It, yeah, whether this is legend or not, um, the first book that I ever wrote, and I wrote a lot of little books when I was a kid, um, the first one that I wrote was called um, Herbert the Nearsighted Pigeon, and it was a story about a pigeon who was suddenly having trouble getting along with his friends. He couldn't understand why. And he, lo and behold, discovered that he needed glasses and that he didn't recognize his friends because he had a, a problem even seeing them. So, and the story had no human characters. It was all animals. Wow. Um, and according to family legend, I was about five when I wrote it. And that's why I'm saying maybe it's a legend. <laughs> I was a little older, but I was certainly young. And it was certainly the first book that I ever wrote. Oh, that's, that's amazing. I love it. Oh, oh now. Okay. Sorry, so here my, we go. Well, I, as <laughs> I was telling you, I have a very playful, smooth fox terrier who 
doesn't understand why I'm not available to play catch with him right now. So uh, you may hear from him a little okay. bit. Okay. Well, I was saying we don't mind that here. We, we welcome that. Now, I, I you want to talk a little bit about Buck is his name, right? And how you acquired yes. him or when you acquired him. As well, well. Uh, Buck is actually a funny story. Um, we already had a dog, a very beloved Welsh Springer Spaniel who um, was just turning 11. And I began getting that anxi <laughs> the anxiety that you have when you have a pet who's getting older. And I thought, you know, I want to get, I want to get another dog now because mm -hmm. I don't want that horrible moment of losing our yep. older dog and not having a dog. And I think like a lot of people during COVID, the idea of getting a puppy was very appealing. Absolutely. It seemed like, well, I'm home all the time. And this is sort of a good moment. And it'll be some a way to keep myself company and have a project. Um, I had forgotten how much a project a puppy is. <laughs> But the thing about Buck that was a funny story is that um, we settled on wanting a smooth fox terrier. Um, and we started looking at rescues, smooth fox terrier rescues. Okay. And we had located a couple of older dogs that needed homes and those fell through. And then we were directed to a breeder in Bakersfield, California who had two, he, he raises dogs for show purposes, okay. and he had two seven-month-old puppies that had been bought by a family in India, and apparently smooth fox terriers are very popular in India. Who knew? You learn something <laughs> new yeah. every day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but during COVID, airlines were not taking oh animals and so he was unable to ship them to India and he waited and waited and like everybody he had originally thought COVID would be a matter of a few weeks sure and then it was turning into months and months and he decided he was giving up on sending the dogs to India and he would look for <laughs> homes for them locally so we lucked into wow. this this very odd situation of these puppies who couldn't go across the world. Um, and I'm hoping oh the God. other puppy, we just took one and that the other puppies certainly also found a, a local home. Great, um, let's look at, um, we have some photo, a few photos of Buck that just to show everyone. Um, and we are also going to just show photos of, of course we can't just do, so that's Buck. Very handsome and adorable. He is. Great, very boopable nose. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Um, they are really striking dogs. And it's interesting because they're a breed that I think used to be quite popular and now you never see them. And people stop us on the street and say, What kind of dog is that? They can't figure out what kind of breed he is um because you just don't see them around they often win the the dog shows though i right i believe that there have been many that have won in in the past yeah, yeah. And, and you know they're very good looking dogs yeah. <laughs> um, and they're they're they've got a lot of charisma and so it doesn't surprise me that they do well in the show ring yep, yep. okay and then let's see now like we'll see ivy this is oh, my sweet. beautiful girl, um, who was also uh, an interesting story in getting Ivy, which I'll just tell you briefly. Okay. Uh, I had had a Welsh Springer who we absolutely adored, and he died very suddenly when he was nine, and okay. we were just devastated. And we went back to the breeder and she didn't have any litters on the way and again they're they're a pretty rare breed you just don't see them much and i really wanted another welshie because of having lost this dog so suddenly and this was during the great recession of 11 years ago okay. um and we located through a breed rescue this dog who had been a fancy purebred who um, with a fancy pedigree 
and she'd been bought by family that had then lost their house through a foreclosure and lost their jobs, which was very much the story of the recession of people, you know, huge number of foreclosures and they couldn't keep their pets. And so they returned her at six months old to the breeder in hopes of getting their money back. Wow. And at that time, I actually wrote a little story about what was going on during the recession and how many people were giving up pets because either they couldn't afford to take care of the pet or in the case of this family, they no longer had, they didn't know where they were going to live Sure, yeah. and they yeah. couldn't keep any animals. So, you know, pets often uh, cycle through society um, and have the ups and downs that you don't really think about until suddenly you're confronted with something like this. It was a, a huge surprise to me. I, I didn't think of the uh, subprime mortgage collapse as having anything to do with animals, but in fact it did. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay, and we have one more. We can't forget the cat, of course. So very, very handsome. He's a very handsome cat. We got him from a cat rescue that had a million cats of every sort. And um, we had never seen a cat this color. And so we just instantly mm. fell in love with him. And he, he's a great cat. He's He's also about 11, I would say. Okay, but, oh, great, okay. You know, cats don't show their age. No, they really I mean, don't. He looks, they really like, don't. He looks exactly the same as the <laughs> day we got him. And so I keep asking him, what's your secret? <laughs> what's going great. on? You look perfect. They don't get gray. I mean, my dog shows her age. You know okay. she's an older dog, so... And I, on the other hand, do not show my age. So no, I'm, I'm all. glad about that. <laughs> Great. Oh, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for, for sharing and letting us see them. They're really wonderful. Um, and then I guess just let's talk about, I'm curious about the role that, you know, your pets as a child. I know, you know, I did read that you had to have a marketing strategy to get your, your mom to agree to it. So just, the, you know, the role that of, the dog that you had growing up or wasn't necessarily the one that you chose or didn't pet. So right. go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I grew up um, just from the minute I can remember, I loved animals. I pined for animals. And my mom was afraid of dogs. She did not grow up with any pets and was really nervous around dogs. So she did not want a dog. We had to really work on her. And we finally figured out that part of her wariness about having a dog was thinking that dogs are dirty and they track in mud and the house will be a mess. So my brother and sister and I um, found a picture of a West Highland White Terrier. And I have to say, they look like the cleanest dogs they ever. Really did. They just look clean. And they're small, so yep. we thought, you know, she won't be scared of the dog. And we just mounted this tireless campaign, and she caved in. Oh, really remarkable, because this was something she never wanted a dog. And predictably, she fell madly in love with the dog, would cook him meals, was devoted to the dog. You know, this, I think this is a common Absolutely. outcome of this sort of story, but we... You know, it was, um, I, I felt it in my bones from the time I could remember that I wanted to be around animals. And I was a big horseback rider as a kid. Yep. It was, you know, my favorite activity. I And I have to give my parents credit. They spent a lot of time schlepping me out to horseback lessons. And I'm sure they thought, what? how on earth did we end up with a child who's so mad for horseback riding, but it was yep. just the thing I love doing. Absolutely. And they, they enabled me as much as they could. They never bought me a horse, which I'm still bitter about, but they, they did everything short of that. Um, and, you know, being around animals just confirmed to me that it was something that felt so natural to me. Mm -hmm. And and 
not being around them felt unnatural. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so it, it, it was never that it felt like an add on. It felt yep. like a natural part of my life. Right. Yep. Um, with that, you also you connect the animals in the book to, you know, the animals you've owned to kind of various points in your life um, and also where you were living. Um, you know, whether it's Manhattan, the Hudson Valley and L.A., um, you know, just that idea of home and where you were and just what the animals meant at that time. Um, can you speak up just a little bit about that? I'm just you know, very curious. At just well, sure. And, and certainly I've had a couple of different iterations of my life with animals. Yeah. Um, my childhood dog. Then when I was in college, I did the very foolish thing of getting my own dog when I was in college. Um, not, a not a good idea, I think, but I, I loved her dearly and she lived to be 13 years old. So wow. I, I had her in my life for a very long time. When she died, I didn't get another dog for a while because I was really traumatized mm -hmm. by losing her. And she unfortunately had a, a kind of long drawn out sad yeah. death and uh, it was something where I thought I can't do this again when I met my husband he said oh my gosh how can you not have a dog and it was interesting wow. because I always thought what would it be like if I met someone I really liked but he didn't like animals Absolutely. Uh, I mean it was something I never really thought of but then I thought oh wow that would be complicated absolutely i i can't imagine what it would mean if i was told that no i i really don't like animals and i don't want any animals um my husband was very enthusiastic i'm not sure he wants three animals <laughs> but um you know he's he's very devoted to them we then uh, moved to the Hudson Valley and we had a farm up there. It was about 55 Amazing. acres. So for an animal lover, this was suddenly like a gateway drug. You yep. know, I was in a position to really have just about any animal I wanted. Wow. At least mm. in terms of having space. Yep. And at least in terms especially of- Especially coming from Manhattan, especially, right? right. Then it, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. this was like a pent up <laughs> desire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> finally fulfilled. And yeah. we did have, um, you know, an enormous amount of land that was very well suited to animals. I love livestock. I've always been fascinated by farm animals. And I thought, well, I want- some farm animals. I didn't mm -hmm. want another dog or another cat, but I really love the idea of having some domesticated farm animals. Mm -hmm. I got chickens and uh, I sort of surprised myself because I never thought I was interested in chickens, but I like the idea that I would have livestock that were not bigger than me, Mm -hmm. So I, I was, I didn't have that sort of fear of like, you know, these are big animals sure. and I don't know how right. to take care of them. Right. And also that I would get a protein from them without having to kill them, which seemed kind of Amazing. brilliant. So I got chickens, I got them by mail order, which was really one of the funniest experiences of my life. I ordered a chicken coop that came with chickens. <laughs> And they were delivered to the post office and the post office called me and said, you've got a package here and it's making a lot of noise. And I thought, oh, okay, it's yeah. my chickens. <laughs> um, and then, and I love the, having chickens. I just love- I loved reading about, yeah. Well, they, the chickens, were, yeah. they were just delightful. So I got more chickens and more chickens, <laughs> and then I got guinea fowl, and then I got ducks, and I got geese. And, you know, this is the thing when you have a lot of land. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal if you're coming home from the grocery store and someone has a sign up saying guinea fowl for sale. Yeah. You think, oh, yeah, I could have some guinea fowl. Why not? And then I got turkeys. 
which I absolutely loved my turkeys. And, um, and then we got cattle. We decided to get uh, raise beef cattle, which was really interesting. Wow. And um, it, we had 10 Black Angus. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this was a point in my life, also through a matter of various coincidences, we ended up at that point having three cats, which was never intended, but there was a stray and there was another one and another okay. one. It was just, you know. Yeah we ended up with three cats. So we had a lot of animals at that point. And I loved the sense of, of rhythm that taking care of the animals mm -hmm. gave my life. And at that time, my son was also very young. So I was, oh, I was already in a rhythm that was not my own, which was taking care of my child and being on that kind of schedule. And so it was in many ways an ideal time to also have all of these other creatures that I was nurturing. And it, it was so, really so rewarding and so wonderful. And the only thing I didn't like about it was having to um, cope with the inevitable um, loss of particularly poultry. And as anybody who has chickens knows, um, you're really sort of renting them. You, you're, you know, everybody eats chicken, including dogs, mm. owls, hawks, raccoons, everything. And I went from the idyllic of letting my chickens free range all over the place and, and, you know, letting them just walk around all day long and then go into the coop at night. And then one by one, they were being picked off by yeah. predators. And suddenly I got into defense mode, which is, all right, how, how can I build Fort Knox here? Oh yeah. <laughs> to protect my chickens and wow. you know it's a uh, it's an, a very frustrating part of being a small farmer which is you don't have 2,000 chickens you have 10 chickens and you know them all and you Absolutely. know their names and when one gets eaten by a raccoon you you mourn them very dearly um, and, and the life you want to give them of being able just to walk around all day long and enjoy themselves, you know, the cost of that is that you'll lose one every week or so. I mean, the, the stakes are very, very high. So that was, um, and I didn't yet have the cynicism that I think a lot of people develop, which is, well, you, one gets eaten and then you get another one. Um, oh. On that note, I know just to bring up um, beauty, right? That and yes. chicken Orlean, right? That again, this became your pet and went you know, and talk a little bit about that. That the other, your neighbor was you didn't quite understand, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Well, when my chicken, um, who I really loved, she was one of my first chickens and she started, she couldn't stand up and I took her to my vet. Um, and my vet said to me, look, I, I did one semester of avian medicine in school. I mean, she mostly was taking care of horses and cows. And she said, I, I don't know what's wrong with her. And I'm not sure I would be able to treat her. And I ended up calling Tufts Veterinary School to um, talk to an avian expert there. I, I mean, I was just really trying my best to figure uh, out what was wrong with her. And I said to one of my neighbors, I don't know what to do. My chicken's sick. And he looked at me and he basically made a snapping <laughs> gesture. And, you know, I was horrified, but I also thought, well, I can't be judgmental about this because the fact is if you're a farmer and you have a sick chicken, probably what you're thinking of is, I don't want my other chickens to Absolutely. get sick in case this is contagious. And I'm not going to spend hundreds of dollars trying to cure whatever is ailing this chicken. And 
I'm pretty sure she had Merrick's disease, which I don't think is curable anyway. Okay. Um, and I eventually had her euthanized because, um, you know, she was she very yeah. sick. Yeah. But it was a, a moment of reckoning where I thought I'm responding to her like she's a pet. Absolutely. But I'm not a farmer by profession. And I'm, you, you have all of these different sort of levels of intimacy with animals. I think that there's, there's a very big difference between the animals we bring into our house and the animals that live outside. And I, you know, that makes sense to me. The animal that sleeps in your bed, you feel a connection that's a familial kind of connection. Sure. The animals that live outside, generally we have a more distant relationship, except maybe for horses. I mm -hmm. think horses kind of fall into a bit of a different category. But certainly the livestock that you're raising largely because of a service they're providing for you, there is a little bit more of an expediency about how people treat them when they're sick. Sure. And, and, I, and particularly chickens. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't put a lot of value on chickens. Chickens are very inexpensive. I think if you had a champion dairy cow, you I, would, yeah. you'd go to great lengths to treat their illnesses. But a chicken, chickens, you can get a chicken for a couple of dollars. Um, and they're treated as being somewhat less, um, just lower on the hierarchy of animals than, than a mammal, I think. But then when you get to know them and they become your chicken and your pet and you know right. their personality, right? It's, it's, right. it's hard. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, and <laughs> I, different. I, I felt um, that, you know, losing chickens to predators was the first level at which I had to kind of grapple with what it's like to be a farmer and to have yes. these animals that live outside that are vulnerable that can be eaten or get sick or have an accident you know it's really different from a cat or a dog where we really monitor their movements we know yes. what they're doing we know where they sleep at night and um and they're not exposed to that kind of predation or you know nature's course really mm -hmm. I, I do know I mean and part of it is you know AMC we do have an avian exotic medicine department here and people do bring their chickens and people bring their guinea pigs and you know which growing up I had we had guinea pigs but it, people didn't really bring them to the vet at that time but now people come they do you know surgery on them as well as their you know lizards and bearded dragons and just the work that they do is amazing and just even you know i look at people's pet rats that they'll spend thousands of dollars on when in the meantime you know it's it's it is the same species you know we're doing all we can outside to with rodenticide so it, it is it is yeah amazing when, when it right when it becomes your pet it's it's different you have a different feeling yeah so, and yeah. I, I think that um one of the, the topics that I explored a lot in this book is what is our relationship to animals Absolutely. and that it can range from that it's basically your family and you see absolutely no distinction between your human family and your pet family to them being in service to you. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. one of the stories that I enjoyed doing the most, which was uh, about um, Morocco and the donkeys sure. of Morocco. And I just out of impulse, every time I would um, be chatting with someone who had a donkey, and there were, you know, many, many donkeys in Fez, because it's a walled city, and you can't have cars. So right. everything is done by donkey. And I would always say to the owner of the donkey, oh, what's your donkey's name? And they would look at me and say, Hamar. And I met the next person. I said, oh, what's your donkey's name? 
and you know they kind of look at me like mm, uh hamar and i started thinking wow that's weird that's such a popular name <laughs> for donkeys and then i asked someone and discovered that it it's just arabic for donkey for donkey and none of the donkeys <laughs> had names they and, and in fact the reason people were looking at me so quizzically was that they it never had occurred to them to name their donkey and oh. that this was a work animal and i said to one guy what why doesn't he have a name and he said he doesn't need a name he's a taxi <laughs> Gosh. yeah that's different and, you know it was they weren't it wasn't a matter of cruelty it was a right. matter of no sentimentality that these were working animals that did a job and they didn't see them as pets and you know there was certain behavior that kind of sloshed over into being neglectful and not very kind to the animals and this was definitely an issue so i i, I don't want to sugarcoat it sure yeah it was behavior and, you know, a, a kind of um, some folk treatments and so forth that were really pretty cruel. But in terms of how, what was their attitude is this is a, this is my car. I don't give a name to my car. Of course, I thought I do give a name to my car. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. that's Maybe funny. that's the difference between right. me and you. But, right, um, right. But it, I found that really, really interesting and something that, um, again, it was a, a moment of being looked at through the eyes of another culture and kind of wondering why would you name a donkey? Very interesting, yeah. Yeah. All right, great. Now, another um, one of your stories I'd love to ask you about is Little Wing, um, about, which is about the homing pigeons. Again, the idea of home and having to, to give up these pigeons. But that was a really beautiful story as well. If you could talk a little oh, bit about thank that. You. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, this was, um, it was a really interesting world to go into. I knew nothing about homing pigeons except whatever little bit you pick up through pop culture. And I met this young girl who trained homing pigeons, which in itself was a fabulous story because there are very few girls and very few young girls yeah. in the sport of racing pigeons. It's, it's mostly elderly men. So, right. you know, she was certainly an anomaly in this world. But what made it particularly poignant is that her family had just made the decision to move. Mm. And as I discovered um, in the course of the reporting with homing pigeons, they don't move. If you are, if you've trained a homing pigeon to think of one place as its home and you move, it's very, very difficult, not impossible, but extremely difficult to retrain them to think of a new place as being home. In other words, if you move and you release your pigeons, they're gonna go back to your old house. They're not wow. gonna to come to your new house. So the alternative, if you wanna keep your pigeons is you can never let them fly free again. Oh, wow. You move with them and you keep them in, a, in an aviary and they're never allowed to fly again or they'll, they'll wow. head off to their old home. And it was no matter very, how far away, it be, right? It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it's it was so poignant to me mm -hmm. because um, people move more easily than that, but there is also still that tug that we all have to the first place we think of as home. Um, and yes, we can we can learn of a new home. Yeah. But these pigeons exist in a, a, a different category where once they have a home, that's the only home they ever really know as a home. And she was struggling with this decision about what to do with her birds and whether um, she was willing to make them what they call prisoners, namely birds that are never allowed to fly free, which is 
Mm -hmm. kind of sad. I mean, unless you have a very large aviary, uh, it's not a very happy life for a bird um, or, you know, what she was going to do with them. So the story really tracked her in the course of time where she had made the decision to try to find people who had large aviaries where the birds could live the, live out their lives in more, at least happier circumstances. Wow, that's, that's very hard. I'm sure it was hard for her. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it was, and it was a very poignant story, um, just thinking about home. And mm -hmm. her, her mother had grown up in the house that they lived in and had lived in that neighborhood her whole life and they were uprooting and moving pretty far away like 35 or 45 minutes away uh -huh. and certainly leaving behind a place that was so familiar for a place that was had less crime and the houses uh -huh. were less crowded but they were giving up something that they really identified as home mm. wow yeah. um another story again exploring this this theme which i love of home is is where's willie um about keiko who's the orca um you know it also taps into the idea i guess of upsetting an animal that has only been raised into captivity yeah free you know or attempting to right so yeah yeah and and this was a really uh transformational story for me, um, really confronting the idea of captivity mm -hmm. and whether really we can ever properly care for wild animals in captivity. Willie, uh, or he, you know, Keiko, which was his real name, was probably as as bad an example as you could come across of an animal that was taken as a very young, I think they think he was maybe a year old when he was captured and being held in captivity first in really dismal circumstances and then in better circumstances, but always in captivity. Mm -hmm. And there was a great, uh, outcry after Free Willy, the movie came out and people started saying, well, wait a minute, what happened to the whale who was in the movie? Uh, which is something that Warner Brothers had not anticipated and they had not prepared in any way for people to come to them and say, what happened to that whale? The one who you really used in the movie. And that whale was living in a horrible, tiny little pool in Mexico City, wow. uh, really bad circumstances. So, you know, much, um, so much money was spent and so many um, people got involved in this effort to take Keiko and repatriate him to the wild. At this point, there were many people privately who felt that it was never gonna happen, that, mm -hmm he had been in captivity for so long that he wasn't particularly interested in being in the wild. He was much more accustomed to people than to whales. Yeah. He was much more accustomed to being fed than to hunt. Right. And, um, and also there were people who felt very, um, concerned about the idea of spending so much money, and I'm talking millions of dollars, to put one whale back in the wild, as opposed to using that same amount of money for whale conservation more sure. broadly. So there were so many issues involved in this story, and it was so complicated. Um, so much money, so many people who had their hopes riding on the idea that Keiko one day would say, now I remember what it's like to be a wild <laughs> whale and I'm going to go off into the wilderness. And he did leave his pen 
um, at the time that I had gone to see him in Iceland and had joined a pod of wild whales. And they had headed off to Norway, which was um, kind of a bad choice since Norway hunts whales. <laughs> but more importantly, he started hanging out uh, in a city park and a pier and playing with children and getting handouts from people and, you know, really essentially found his way back to people. Always people. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, eventually he returned to Iceland um, or rather, no, eventually he was in a facility in Norway. They, they kind of, brought him into a protective custody in Norway. And um, unfortunately he got pneumonia and died mm. at not a very advanced age, but, and he wasn't young at that point. Right. It's hard to know what his natural lifespan really would have been, but it was a crazy story and and it really made me think about captivity in a way I never had before that. Absolutely. Uh, the one anecdote I, I, just, I really love from that is the one about the feather, if you can just how he does oh, so well, it. Oh, well, yeah. it, was, it was actually so sweet because one of the things that worried people who were working with Keiko was that he was so gentle and he didn't seem to uh, act very much like a killer whale. And they had trained him on a number of behaviors. And one was to train him to go down to the bottom of the, um, down to the ocean floor and bring something up from the ocean floor. And usually when an orca will do that behavior, they bring up like a rock or a boulder or something, mm -hmm. some big giant heavy thing. And Keiko, went down to the ocean floor and came back up holding a little tiny feather. <laughs> and it was a little feather from a puffin and he dropped it. And so the trainer sent him back down thinking, all right, I'm gonna send him back down again with the same command and he'll come up this time with a boulder or a log or some giant thing from the bottom of the ocean. And he came back up with the same feather. <laughs> And, you know, it was a moment where you thought, I don't know, maybe he really isn't meant to be wild. I mean, maybe at this point, he's really like a puppy dog and he's really never going to adapt to a life in which he has to, you know, eat a seal or, you know, attack um, a, a herd of uh, walruses. I mean, the... He just didn't seem to have the killer instinct if he's carrying feathers around in his mouth. <laughs> no, absolutely. It was very sweet. It was really no, so sweet. Um, I'd love to talk to you just uh, from that. I know um, just about the Hayes Act a little bit you, you mentioned and, and just, you know, that idea. Um, yeah. Also fascinating. Yeah. Well, I, I really learned so much. I mean, that's the thing. It, your stories are just... You know, they're beautiful and and just you know endearing but just you learn so much as well oh, so well, thank yeah, you. yeah i mean that's what i yeah i, I hope the goal i know <laughs> yeah know, well yeah. this was you know i was doing a story about um animals in hollywood and following the american humane film and television unit uh that monitors the safety and treatment of animals on film sets and the treatment of animals in Hollywood had this curious cycle of being bad, then it got good, and then it got really bad. And normally we see a progression towards more positive yeah. thinking about animals and so forth. But what happened was when animal welfare was originally kind of codified in Hollywood, it was part of the Hayes Code, which is the code that is about censoring sexual um, behavior on film, showing couples in bed together, nudity, all of the, the, the things that were 
seen as unacceptable in the 30s and 40s and 50s where, um, and for whatever reason, for legislative reasons, the care of animals was coupled with this rule about censorship of, of sexual and, and morale uh, on film. Well, there was a big pushback against the Hayes Code and people said, never mind, we want to be able to show nudity on film and show couples in bed together and show people smoking cigarettes. So the Hayes Code was overturned wow. and along with it, all the rules about how to treat animals on a film wow. set. And, you know, in the twenties, animals were treated just as disposable props. Um, hundreds of horses would be killed in the filming of a Western, nobody cared. So and, you know, then the rule was through the Hayes Code was protecting animals. And suddenly when the Hayes Code was dissolved, that allowed us to see nudity on film, an unexpected uh, sort of co-related result of that was those rules protecting animals were suddenly gone. And once again, and unfortunately it was a time when Westerns were very popular. Mm -hmm. So you had lots and lots and lots of horses and cattle in films and the treatment once again was egregious. And there was then another push to now properly separate the censorship of um, sexuality from the treatment of animals, which to begin with was a very <laughs> odd thing to yes. couple together. But then it was seen as a separate distinct issue that was probably more related to the way children should be treated on film sets than anything to do with whether it was okay to show a nude body. Right. Um, you know, and it had to do with safety, with um, that you didn't put animals in dangerous situations, that you didn't use some of the techniques such as wire tripping horses to, you know, you have a, a huge stampede of animals and then you want them to fall on cue so you trip them with wires you know which meant so most hard. of them had broke their legs and then were destroyed so all of that became illegal and um and that sort of ushered in the era that we're in now which includes pretty aggressive monitoring of the way animals are used and treated on film sets. So, I mean, it was a fascinating piece of history because I don't think any of us would argue that we'd want to return to an era where there was censorship um, on moral grounds in film, um, but it, it was just an odd bit of legal history that caught animals up in that and now they're treated as their own category with their own rules and um, the, their own monitoring. I, I think you had mentioned in that, that with the, the roaches, right? Is that if you start out with 10,000 cockroaches on, on the set or, or something, you better end up yeah. with 10,000, right? Yeah. Right, That's and the, the um, film and television unit of American Humane has, um, you know, pretty inflexible rules about they see all animals as warranting protection, whether it's a worm or a fly or a horse. And some of, you know, uh, some of these animals like flies would die during the course of a day anyway. But, you know, their feeling is you shouldn't be killing an animal for entertainment purposes. Sure. Um, and I do think with CGI now being as sophisticated as it is, we may see a future in which fewer and fewer animals, real animals are used in movies because it's very complicated um, and expensive to, to make sure animals aren't hurt 
and, and overworked and abused on a film set. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, where I do want to leave some time for, for questions, but I, I just wanted to just give a chance. What are you working on now? Uh, well, I've started a new column for The New Yorker. It's a weekly Excellent. column of um, obituaries. And that's been really interesting. And uh, unlike The New York Times, I'm actually including animals. I've done, I've done two animals already. One was the um, first gray wolf seen in Southern California in 350 years. Um, a gray wolf that had been born in Oregon and had made his way all the way almost to Los Angeles um, and unfortunately was hit by a car and he died this fall. Mm. And the other was a retired racehorse who uh, was the oldest living winner of the Breeders' Cup and he, wow. he was living in a retirement community for old thoroughbreds. Um, oh, wow. And it's been nice uh, and probably not surprising to anybody that I've slipped animals in there as well. But it, it's really been, um, I mean, to me, writing obituaries is, is a very gratifying opportunity to dip into these different worlds. Um, and I'm writing a memoir. So I, I'm That's keeping wrong. myself busy. Good, good, yeah. Um, and raising, well, now your puppy's almost two, right? Or yeah, how but he, he, he's still, still, oh my God, <laughs> he still needs to be raised. <laughs> he's still a young, young at heart. Young at heart, yep. Um, are there any questions? Please people, uh, put them into the chat box. I have more if um, I'll keep going, but just, I would love to hear a little bit also just, we were talking earlier, but just about how, what the introduction was like and how your animals all get along. So I, I love that connection between, especially the inter, interspecies, you know, the cat and dog. Right. There's nothing better that cat than a cat that gets along with a dog. It's, yeah, it's wonderful. well, and it was one of the, um, the considerations we had when we were looking at rescues was to find out if with an older dog, if they were cat safe, because mm -hmm. our cat uh, wanders around with our dog, our older dog, very comfortably and I was really worried I, I've definitely known of dogs who have killed cats yeah so um but you know with an 11 year old spaniel and a seven month old smooth fox terrier you have very different energy <laughs> to say the least yeah, sure. spaniels are already very mellow and all they want to do is snuggle with you and you know they're not hardcore players and when we got buck he was seven months old and he was just like this crazy energy <laughs> and i now understand why people call them terrorists <laughs> and funny. you know i've never had two dogs i've had multiple cats okay, and yeah. you know watching the cats dynamic was certainly instructive because yes. um they don't all get along and they don't nope. You know, they've got turf issues and um, all sorts of stuff. So there's been a lot, we've been very involved. There's a, a lot of psychology in managing, particularly with a dog who's a senior and can get grumpy and a mm -hmm. puppy who doesn't know how to stop. I mean, yep. he's, he's indefatigable. And, um, and so we've had to, you know, order the baby gates from Amazon to yeah. when we need to separate them, we keep them apart That's it, and, yeah. and to have two of everything if possible. But it's, I mean, I find it really interesting. And the cat sits and observes it all with that cat kind of wisdom <laughs> that's, you know, cannot be duplicated in a human or a dog for uh -oh. sure. Absolutely. Okay, we have a question. So have you taught your animals to speak? Uh, no, I have not. <laughs> well, I taught my older dog to bark on command. And then later I thought, why would I ever want her to bark? I mean, it seemed it was one of those tricks that I taught her and then later thought better of it. So, um, but you know, to me, I feel like they're very readable without 
actually voicing anything. They, yeah. It's it's pretty amazing how much communication you can get just by looks and body language um, from animals. And, you know, like everybody in the world, I was given one of those devices that you <laughs> catch their collar that supposedly translates what they're saying, which is really one of the biggest scams ever. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay, I have a question we have. Um, do you think that chickens like being around rooster or do they feel okay without? I, I loved also just all the information you included about roosters. Yeah, know, and just well, and I, I, had, um, I had roosters and they can, I don't, I think chickens are absolutely fine without a rooster. Although roosters supposedly are protective and scare off predators and so forth. And one of the interesting things is if you only have hens, one of them will become the, they don't transition to be male, but they often will get bigger and they'll get, their comb will get bigger. And apparently it's some, it's a biological phenomenon where they become the alpha, which is really interesting. But I had um, one rooster who was absolutely beautiful, but he was so mean <laughs> that I was scared of him. Um, and then I traded him with my neighbor who didn't mind that he was mean. And he gave me his very charming, very sweet rooster who I loved. And he was not, he wasn't that noisy, but that's the big problem. Oh. And that's why many cities have ordinances um forbidding roosters so you can have chickens but you can't you can have oh. hens but you can't yep. have roosters in a, in a lot of cities because of the noise and it, it is they are noisy yeah <laughs> sure um are there significant ways that you perceive the human's perspective on animals changing over time oh i think they're changing radically i i think that we have moved so much more toward recognizing the, the agency that animals have. And I think if you just look at the attitude towards um, the humane raising of livestock, I, I think even 20 years ago, that would not have been on anyone's mind. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't something people thought about. Um, we were really um, removed from our food sources. We, we just didn't think about it. And I think now people are very conscious of it. And, you know, everything from not eating foie gras mm -hmm. or veal to buying pasture raised eggs, you know, this is a, it's a dramatic change. Um, there was a really interesting story in the New Yorker in the last week or so about legal personhood for animals. Yeah. And, and the fact that, I mean, even though the case was not won, the fact that it, there were arguments made that were with merit, mm -hmm. um, I mean, and it, it just raises lots of questions. And I'm not saying that I support the idea of personhood for animals, but I think that we've come to understand the complexity of their lives, the fact that even though we're stronger than many of them and smarter than all of them, um, that we maybe need to have more of an attitude of stewardship rather than domination. Absolutely. Um, and I really, I do think I'm going to close really on or just talking about this quote, which I love from your book, that um, if therapists didn't charge you and were willing to chase sticks, they would be dogs. And I, I just think now more than ever, just, and cats as well, but we just, the role that animals are playing in all of our lives and just um, really kind of keeping us in the moment. Um, I know, and everyone, thank you for joining us. I know it's a very difficult time, but just, yeah, we're all like hugging our animals, I think a, a little tighter and, and just 
these days. You know, so. Yeah. Oh, no, no doubt about it. And um, I see somebody asking, why do I think we're smarter than all of them? Um, I think in sheer uh, brain capacity, we're, we're talking about the sort of computer CPU um, mm -hmm. capacity of humans. There's um, fairly good evidence that we're smarter. It doesn't mean we're wiser. Absolutely. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. They're right. You're right. You're right. Um, oh, wait, we did have a question. Did you hear about the cow on the 210 freeway in LA? No. <laughs> oh, no. That doesn't sound good. No. <laughs> okay. Um, but I have been following um, P22, the mountain lion. And oh. um, he's, you know, I there's a mountain lion in my neighborhood now who walked across my backyard a, a month or so ago. We were away, but I hold out hope that I'll see him someday. Oh, oh definitely. Oh. Uh, let's see. So, well, everyone is just saying thank you and, and what a great event this was and how much they you know, enjoyed your book. Um, and I just want to thank you too for you know spending this your part of your evening with us. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks so thanks much. Everyone thank you. For, for being here today. I appreciate it.